getting a bit longer. Uh -huh. thanks, thanks, everyone. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this is our fifth week on the training course. Uh, thank you very much to all of you for sticking with me. Um, and I hope you're really enjoying following along online at your own pace as well. Uh, pace, pace, pace as well. Um, this week is a very special week because we are going to be covering some fairly heavy topics this week, which are quite important. Um, but I also would like to introduce a very special guest, uh, Steve Ross, who's joining us from the United States this evening. He's going to um, be teaching for the first hour. Um, and then uh, when he has to drop for his call, I'm going to take over for the second hour. And then he's very kindly volunteered to join us on Wednesday as well. So I thought you might enjoy a different voice this week. Uh, so welcome, Steve. Uh, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you, Gemma. And uh, um, big shout out to you. I'm really happy to, uh, to be joining this group and contributing in any way that I can. Well, it means a lot to a lot of people, so thank you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm just uh, astounded at the responses that you've gotten here. Uh, this, I think this is just fantastic. Well, uh, this is uh, 21 of quite a few people, um, and uh, there are a few faces and names that, that show up every week. There'll be some newcomers as well, so uh, hopefully they're all up to date. So they're, they're very au fait with what custom objects, custom fields are. We've talked field level uh -huh. security, buttons, links, actions. Uh, anyone else want to shout something I've missed that you've been learning about? Since you're all experts now. Just watch that all come. You'll find that people tend to communicate through the chat as well so okay so as a logistical uh, yeah this will take a little bit of getting used to but yeah. um so It'll, do you want me to short start sharing my screen certainly so you may find it easier to have the hangout in one screen uh so you can keep an eye on the chat um just in case it's up to you um i can field the questions as well if you like and um, I will make, make you presenter. I think we're recording now. So yeah, off we go. Thanks very much, Steve. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, hello again, everyone. And uh, let me this all set up. Uh, I am now getting my screen ready. Just hang on. So this topic um, is, data, is data security in Salesforce. Hopefully you can all see my screen and pardon me while I just make a few adjustments here. I do want to be able to see the chat window. Hello, everyone. Um, so yeah, my name is Steve Ross. I am uh, a senior Salesforce administrator. I am actually kind of a, um, a hybrid. You know, most people in Salesforce um, can kind of bucket themselves as either administrators, developers, maybe business analysts, uh, maybe someone like Gemma, who's a technical architect. But I consider myself a hybrid. I do both um, administration and developer work, um, sometimes more one than the other. Currently, um, I've been doing more administrative work. I work for a company called LucidWorks in San Francisco, and we do search, uh, search for, um, we're in the search business. Um, so, you can see, I think, um, from this screen, still, you can see my um, LinkedIn um, URL here. And I'm going to share, I'm going to go through a slide deck. I'm going to share this with Gemma, she, she can post it. If anyone wants to connect with me on LinkedIn, please feel free to do that. So our topic is data security. And perhaps you haven't. Um, really discuss this much, um, or maybe Jim hasn't gone over it yet,
But what is data security? And it can kind of sound a little bit um, ominous, uh, maybe a little bit difficult to um, kind of wrap your head around, but data security in terms of Salesforce is really just controlling who sees what. And obviously, uh, it's not always a good idea for everyone to see every different type of record or every different type of object. So you can control this um, in various ways through um, in Salesforce. Now, you may find that in, as you begin and, and continue your Salesforce career that data security may be more important in some companies than other companies. I worked as a consultant, for example, in very small startups where they just wanted everyone to see everything. And we call that a public security model. And they really, it's like a small team. Um, I think at the time when I joined, it was a dozen people. And they just, um, they wanted efficiency rather than security. Other organizations I've worked with have been very security conscious, um, like banks, financial institutions, maybe healthcare systems. And so they spend a lot of time on data security and spend a, a lot of resources and have audit reports. And it's very important to them that the, the right data is seen by the right people. One um, kind of hallmark of data security is that in Salesforce, it's really better um, to start out being thinking about security than rather doing it later. That is, um, I've worked at organizations where maybe they started out small, had a public model where everyone could see everything, and then later on, they, they found problems with this and tried to tighten security. And it's much more difficult to tighten security later than to think about it right off the bat and, and try and set things up um, secure in the beginning. At Salesforce, they, they make it easier to kind of broaden access than to tighten it down. And, and you'll, you'll see what I mean later. Um, I do want to be able to, um, I'm going to check the chat occasionally here. Uh, and thank you for the nice comments, everyone. So you may have guessed that security in Salesforce, it, it is a balance between convenience and, and, and being secure. And as I said, much easier to open things up than to close things down. Generally, um, I feel if you have to make a decision about security, um, it's better to err on the side of being too secure, kind of too locked down, than to being too open. If you deny someone access to something, it's relatively easy to give them access to that, and then all will be kind of forgiven, and you can move right along. But if the wrong people see the, you know, perhaps some information that they really shouldn't see, the consequences can be a lot more dramatic and um, uh, can have a lot more negative benefits to the company you're working with, me, your organization, and to your career as well. So keep that in mind. You know, I think it's, it's generally if someone um, gets an error that they can't access something, you know, it's usually not that big a deal to go ahead and open it up so that they can see it. And if they see something they shouldn't be seeing, you may not hear about it until, um, you know, the wrong people are contacting you, like the company's lawyers or something. So something to keep in mind. Um, Salesforce has different levels of access. And... At the very bottom, uh, excuse me for a moment here, there is org-wide access. So org-wide access kind of is at the IP level. Um, I don't know, that that's the, um, the internet protocol level, the, uh, the address that you may have. And if you're not familiar with that, but every computer, um, every internet connection has a, has a very specific IP address. And you can whitelist or blacklist or block or allow 
um, users at that IP level. You can also set password policies so that maybe support technicians can only access cases during support hours or um, maybe you know you only want people logging in on certain days maybe you need to shut your org down for some maintenance during certain hours and you want to block people from coming in um, that would be a really nice thing to do i can't usually manage to do that um, where i am working but i would love to be able to do that more uh, Oren wide access also includes password policies. Like for example, at my company now, we require everyone to reset their password. I think it's after three months. Um, if you try and log in like five times and fail, you're blocked, those types of things. So those are all examples of org wide access. Um, much more, you know, what, what this module in data security is really focusing more is on object level access and record sharing access, okay? So that's really all you need to know. You, you can, you have a lot of control at the org access level, but it's not that frequent that you need to really go in and change that. Usually it's set up once and then um, really do not need to touch that again. The other thing to keep in mind, um, there's a couple of acronyms. One is CRED which is create, read, edit, and delete. And the other one is CRUD, which are really synonymous, but create, create, read, update, and delete. And these are types of permissions that you can have on records. So um, for an example, um, let's talk about an account. Some people in your organization may be able to create accounts and others may not. So for example, maybe your failed um, sales reps, or sales management. Um, it is part of their job to create accounts. But your inside sales team, they're supposed to be working leads and not necessarily creating accounts. Um, you know, if you work on, um, I don't know how many of you have worked in sales organizations. I do a lot of work with sales organizations. So it's, it's very, um, usually a big part of my job is to kind of delineate who can see what, that like the inside sales team, they really just have access to the things that they need. The field sales reps, they have access to the things that they need. Sales management has access to the things that they need. So that is all part of data security. It is again, you know, controlling who sees what and who can do what, okay? So security, um, we talked about org-wide access. Object level access, like accounts, contacts, opportunities, who should be able to edit, who should be able to create, that is all um, controlled under object level access. Field level access, on the other hand, is maybe everyone has access to an account, but there, there may be some um, secure information that only a few people can see. Or for example, on user records, maybe there's some personnel information that only certain people in uh, human resources should be able to see. So you can um, control it at the field level. So in, in the US, we have like social security numbers that are quite, um, you know, that shouldn't be available to just everyone, only a few people. So you would make these kind of more confidential fields um, would hide those for most people and only open it up for other people. Um, I'm hoping this is all making sense and I'm, I'm occasionally just chant, chatting the, uh, checking the, the, the chat window. Yeah, and Jim says, remember we talked about record owners. Um, that is true. In Salesforce, um, every record needs to have an owner, okay? And that, um, because of that, that has a big implication in security. So object level access, field level access. Um, now let's talk about record level access. So let's, let's um, I, I always think that it's helpful to kind of uh, make it very concrete. So let's say Gemma and I are working together and Gemma and I are both part of the inside sales team and she is working some leads and I am working some leads, okay? And remember leads are just a Salesforce object. 
Now, should I be able to see the leads that Gemma is working? Um, maybe or maybe not. You know, uh, you know. So, so think about um, the. These are rec. This is all record level access. Sometimes, and and make it a little simpler. Let's break it down into three different categories. There's records level records that I own. And usually um, we, we call this kind of the God level of access. For records that I own, I can do anything I want with them. I can create them, I can edit them, maybe I can even delete them. And so I can do what I please with my records. But with Gemma Leeds, if she owns those, um, I may or may not be able to read or edit those. It all depends on the re record level access, okay? Now there's another thing, maybe Jim and I are working as a team, okay? And so then there's this concept, well, maybe we kind of share some leads and Salesforce has ways um, of making that um, uh, happen as well through like opportunity teams or account teams, and then people can collaborate, okay? So, it's the, this, this, if Gem I are, are sharing some leads, or maybe we're sharing an account, she or I will still be the owner, but on an account that I own, she could go in and do some updates. Maybe she wants um, to add some comments. Maybe she wants to do some um, updating after she has reached out and talked to somebody on um, that account. Okay, continuing on with record level access. So record level access, it's a little bit like an onion, okay? And, and we can, it has different layers. So we start at the far left, which is OWD, you'll, you'll see this acronym a lot, is organization-wide defaults. And Salesforce has a baseline for every object, um, or the object um, organization-wide defaults. And there's different types of uh, restrictions on these. And we have public read-write. Um, public is generally, everyone can see this, um, this type of object, whether it's um, account, contact, lead. Um, and then on the other hand, private, um, which is probably more common, is that only the owners um, of these records can see them and others cannot. Now, a lot of times, um, if I am, um, I'll, I'll keep going back to the inside sales team. If I'm working on the inside sales team, maybe, uh, and so is Gemma, we can't see each other's leads, but we have a manager, maybe Sue is our manager. Sue manages most uh, Gemini. Well, Sue needs to be able to see both Gemma's leads and my leads to kind of, you know, see how we're doing, check in on us. So we use the role hierarchy then to open up access. So a person above us in the role, in the, in the hierarchy, can see both of our records, okay? Sometimes um, role hierarchies follow the organization structure of a company, and sometimes they may not, but it's pretty typical. <coughs> Excuse me. Drink. It is pretty typical that a role hierarchy at least starts out following the organization kind of like an org chart of a company. Okay. Beyond the role hierarchy, um, there are other ways to share records. And we have, <clears throat> we can use automation, we can use something called sharing rules, whereas um, maybe I am a sales rep working on in the Western territory and any lead or maybe any account with in the Western territory, I need access to. Well, we would set up a rule based on that criteria of uh, on the, maybe a, we have a territory field capturing which territory that lead or account is in. So we could have a rule saying, if a lead is assigned to the Western territory, Steve gets access. If a lead is assigned to the Eastern territory, Gemma gets access to it. 
And that way um, we can we, we can have some automation and not be manually like trying to um, manually share these records. I said manual sharing. That is kind of the last um, layer of record sharing is that if I'm working on a lead, maybe we don't, um, I'm working in the Western division and Gemma needs to, um, she says, oh, I, I, I need access to, to that a little bit. I'm, I'm working um, with someone else connected on that. We don't have automation set up to share that lead. So I may give some, do some what was called manual sharing to let Gemma kind of temporarily get access to that. And then um, I may remove that later. Think of manual sharing as kind of like a one-off, you know, kind of an exception that happens. We don't really have rules set up to cover it, but occasionally we just need to quickly um, be able to uh, give someone access. So over here, um, we have a table, which is kind of typical. If you were working in a brand new org and you had to set up um, security in a brand new org, you may list out, like in a spreadsheet, all the different Salesforce objects and think about your baseline permissions, like accounts. Who should be able to um, CR, that's part of the CR and CRED, that's create and read. Should everyone be able to create and, and have read access to accounts? Um, opportunities. Here, we um, in our table, we're giving everyone create, read, and edit access to um, opportunities. And again, this is all, would all be set up at the lowest level here at the OWD um, level. And I wanted to show you Let's just um, jump into an example here. So in your org, if you go to short sharing settings and quick find, you will see here um, organization-wide defaults. And this is one area um, where you can set this, this, this up, for example. Okay. There's other places as well. But that's kind of the, this is, that's where you would go to start setting up the baseline. So when you're thinking about um, your, your, your organization-wide defaults, you want to think about the most restrictive um, users that you have. If you have an organization of 100 people, but there are like five people that should never be able to create accounts then you want to um, remove that from everyone and open it up later for the other 95 people that do need to create accounts. Because you'll see, this is the only place where you can restrict sharing access. All these other um, features that Salesforce has, all they can do is open up access, okay? And that's a really important concept in Salesforce is that it's easier to open up than to make, than make it more restrictive. It is, in fact, it's almost, um, as far as record level access, your restriction, it has to be within the OWD layer. You can't make something more restrictive layer, so, later. So if you start off making things public and open, you cannot use other features to um, limit, limit record sharing. Um, I hope that makes sense. Does, um, I'm gonna just, Pause here for a second. Does anyone have any questions? I'm checking the chat. Making sense, good, yep. Ah, Gemini has talked about Teams before. Okay, good, yep. That is, um, not every organization uses Teams. Um, the, the organization I'm working in now um, uses Teams quite a bit. But I've worked at places where um, they haven't used Teams at all. But it's a very powerful feature to allow um, salespeople, it's, it's most often salespeople, to work together. Yeah, we've talked about case teams, um, opportunity teams, and account teams. We've also talked, even talked about default account teams. Uh-huh. Good. Yeah, it's um, 
probably a feature that if you use Teams correctly, um, it really makes other, um, you can reduce like the number of permission sets and other things that you, you're doing to, to open things up. And that's a really important point, actually, Steve. Um, certainly as an administrator, um, keeping things clean and tidy, keeping things, keeping um, the administrative overhead um, as minimal as possible is quite a priority for all of us who um, work with Salesforce, whether we're client facing um, or not. Um, we like to try and leave a good trail behind us. We've talked about the descriptions, we've talked about um the various different solutions that we have um i've i've logged into all before where things have been a little bit crazy and uh you kind of wondered what what the, what's the reasoning behind a lot of the the there must be a good reason why there's 15 sharing rules you know so you start oh yeah yeah the onion layers a little bit and then you realize yeah. you know there are a variety of reasons as to why they're there so keeping things tidy and and in, and uh, easy to find easy to understand is is a huge priority for us yeah and sometimes you have to push back a little bit i mean you probably have been in organizations Gemma, where they haven't really seen the value of security and they said oh just make everything you know public or make everyone a system administrator please yeah <laughs> And and then, you know, you really have to kind of step back and say, well, you know, that's just not a best practice. You you may regret that down the line as uh, as people have, you know, really un you know uh, uh, access that they really shouldn't have, you know. So um, the, uh, the diplomatic way of putting it, I tend to give them the side eye. <laughs> <laughs> say are you sure you want to do that you know it's like and just um and it's easy to come up with like a few well here's you know i i can do that but here's something to be aware of you know here's something else to be aware of so as as salesforce administrators or you know we we really need to um keep best practices in mind and that is definitely a best practice is that to um set up your security model um, appropriately. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about, um, so we talked about, we're, we're still on the topic of sharing and sharing records. And because this is really important. And we talked about sharing rules. It is sharing rules are a way to create um, automatic exceptions. Now, as Gemma said, sometimes you may go into an org and they have a crazy number of sharing rules. Hopefully they will all have descriptions and, and so it's easy to understand the reasoning behind them. So when you do create sharing rules, um, just you wanna make them well documented. So someone else coming in behind you can understand what was done, okay? Sharing rules can be done a, um, a couple of ways. You can make them like um, by owner so that if whenever um, say Gemma owns an account, I'm, um, I'm also added uh, if Gemma and I are working together or vice versa. But there would probably be other ways. That's kind of a poor example, actually. There'd be other ways to, to better do that. But these are automatic exceptions um, to record sharing. Okay. And let's see. I actually have, let's see if I can go to my link here. Well, you can see the picture here um, um, that I have. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm not going to take the time. In in the um, when you're walking through the or you're working through the trailhead module, you're going to create some sharing rules. So I won't bother you with all the details of that right now. Um, so sharing rules they can be automated, or you can have the manual sharing if it's kind of a one-off thing that needs to be done, you know, really quickly for a very specific person for a very specific reason. Um, now. Um, I, it is my understanding that manual sharing is only available in classic. And um, 
maybe Gemma, unless you know differently, but uh, to, to do this, you may have to switch from lightning to classic to um, put in your sharing rule or your, your manual sharing. So kind of makes it a little, I don't know, a little less useful. You're, you're, there are still items, um, still some features that are available in classic that are not in lightning. Um, Salesforce is continually getting better about these. It was really painful, um, you know, a year or two ago, and we were bouncing back and forth between Classic and Lightning quite a bit. Uh, but Lightning still doesn't um, have full parity with all the features that Classic has. Hello. So I believe they have now rolled out sharing Lightning. Um, it's not okay. Okay. So maybe this isn't correct here. Um, I'm going to change this. I'm going to say it. We're human, so we learn by trial and error. So we yeah, can yeah. find that I'm talking complete rubbish. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it'd be great if someone, um, you know, could as, take that as a little uh, little investigation assignment to say, okay, in Lightning, can you create a manual sharing rule or uh, create manual sharing? And uh, I I tried it and, and it didn't look like it was available to me, but um, maybe I wasn't looking in the right spot. Can I add something really quickly as well? With oh, the, sure. With the sharing, um, those of you who like to get a bit funky with code, you can actually affect sharing using code as well. Um, so if those of you who are interested in the developer route a bit further down the line, um, this is also something you can do programmatically, but we don't cover that in this course. Yeah, yeah, and I can speak to that too, Jim. I've had to do that before. Um, I have done some work in like um, portals where you had had like a hierarchy and you had to like programmatically create the sharing um to like a, a top level organization and a sub organization beneath it because wow. that wasn't um kind of inherently done so um uh i've had to, i've had to do that type of um type of stuff and okay um so we kind of briefly talked on organizational wide defaults um, um wanted to get into a little more detail on that and when you're you know, if you were starting in a brand new org, this is where you would begin. You know, you would, you would, um, well, let me actually, this is kind of a good question. How, if you were um, starting in a brand new org, what would be the best steps? And they said, okay, um, you know, um, uh, Gemma, we have a brand new Salesforce org. Please um, set up our, our security model for us. You know, what, what would you do? Well, um, one of the things, um, you know, we may all answer that question a little bit differently, but one is that I would really try and understand the business, understand who needs access to what, the different roles that people have, you know, so we'd be doing a lot of talking, trying to understand. And, and I think that is a better approach than just jumping in and saying, well, looking at the org chart, I think this is what ought to be done, you know. Um, sure, the, the org chart of the company um, may be a good place to start, but you really need to talk to people, talk to like the you know sales managers and say, okay, what does your team need access to? What does your team need to do? And then building up um, some spreadsheets or tables saying, okay, this is how I'm going to build it out. Um, you know, that is um, at, least, at least one good approach. But when you finally have, um, you've talked to people and are, and are ready to start building it out, the OWD um, is where you would start, okay? And your options are private, um, public read-only, public read-write, public read-write transfer. And transfer in Salesforce terms, that means you can change um, ownership. You're allowing others to take um, access of records. So the, generally, um, the organizations I've been um, involved in, things have been set up in private. Um, in, in not, and I think that's the most common because as I said, always easier to uh, give people more access, make it's easier to open it up than to lock it down. 
And when you're looking at um, organization-wide defaults, think about your most restrictive use cases and set things accordingly to those people. Because as you remember back on our um, chart here, this is the only place where you, you have the option of making a restriction. Everything, all these other um, avenues are gonna be opening things up. Role hierarchy. Um, role hierarchy gives access based on roles. And I think just actually looking at it would make things. Let's look here. This is the role hierarchy I have in this development org that I currently have. And you can see um, we can collapse it, kind of make it more simple, but I'm, I'm expanding it here. At the top, just like many kind of organizations, we have the CEO, the CFO, kind of what we call the C-suite, right? And beneath them are um, you know, underneath the chief sales officer, maybe the strategy manager, the training coordinator. Now, is it always best to have the CEO at the top? And this, so what you're you're saying here is that everyone would roll up to the CEO, the CEO would be able to see everyone's records. Now, this may be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, Cause, and, and why could this be a, a problem? Well, how many CEOs are really fluent in Salesforce? Um, chances are, you know, CEOs have other things on their minds than understanding Salesforce um, security models or understanding Salesforce records. So I have found personally that um, they have, sometimes they get confused. And so putting them at the very top of the hierarchy may not always make the most sense if they truly don't need access to everything, okay? But this is, um, you, you add roles here to your hierarchy, you add users to these roles. So for example, if I just click on um, our CEO, I can see um, we have one person assigned to this. We have a, a description about um, how that role is set up, okay? So the role hierarchy is a way to grant access. And usually the idea is that someone's um, above you needs to be able to see the records that you're working on. And people, your peers may not be able to see the same records, okay? Rule of hierarchy just grants access um, to people above you to see more records. Uh, other types, uh, profiles are very important. Every user in Salesforce um, needs a profile. So before you can start adding users, you need to create the profiles. Profiles um, have a lot of power in that, uh, um, and I would imagine some, you, you're all familiar with setting up profiles, um, but you can really, you can specify object level access here um, and, and kind of broadly profiles determine what you can do with the records that you own. Can you, can you, you may be um, able to read accounts, but can you delete them or edit them? And profiles, um, when you're setting them up, you think about kind of categories of users and what they need to do with these records. For example, um, your sales team, your sales reps. If you have a sales, <clears throat> excuse me one moment. If you have a sales rep profile, um, you're, you're thinking about this kind of bucket of users who are all kind of broadly in this category. <clears throat> what do they need access to? Okay, so profiles really help to differentiate different groups of users. And, and that's, I think, um, a useful way to think about profiles. Um, you can definitely have too many profiles or too few profiles. And there's kind of a happy medium that um, you have just enough profiles. You want to, uh, as you create new ones, um, 
occasionally I found it's really helpful to review your old ones. And maybe you have profiles where users um, are no longer active in. Maybe they need to be deprecated. And uh, um, I'm, I'm finding in my current role, I'm working um, at Lucidworks, our org is like 10 years old and we have a lot of technical debt. Um, I'm not sure if, if you've, um, you've probably heard this term before. Um, I don't know if you've talked about it much, but technical debt is just kind of a, the burden of, of things that have been rolled out that are maybe no longer useful that are, is still hanging around. You know, it's kind of like all that junk in your garage and, and you want to be able to find that box of stuff, but you have all these other boxes um, there that maybe you meant to, to donate, to get rid of, but um, there, there's stuff you just don't need anymore. And it's very easy to keep accumulating, you know, if, if you have like a, a series of admins that all come in, create a few profiles, maybe they're contractors, so they're here for six months, they create some profiles and then they leave, and then the next contractor comes in, creates more profiles. Well, you know, should, should you reuse the profile? Should you delete them? And it's really useful to um, keep an eye on these and make sure that there's actually users assigned and they're still doing what you intended. Uh, I'm gonna check the chat again, see if anyone has any questions. So we haven't covered profiles just yet, but we have talked about okay. it briefly. So uh -huh. I think um, I think everybody knows roughly what they're for, what they do. But um, you know, you've given them a really good introduction. Okay, good. Yep, you'll get in this um, module. You're going to be creating some profiles, and you're going to be getting more experience in them. Um, if you do decide to um, continue on as a, a Salesforce administrator. Uh, you're going to get to know profiles really well uh, because when you create new users, you know, you need to decide which profile to give them. And then you need to, maybe you have people complaining that if you have your whole sales team that says, oh, we can know, we used to be able to access leads and now we can't. Well, the first thing, if you had that type of problem, probably the first thing to look at um, would be their profile and see, okay, what, what, um, you know, the sales profile, it should give them access to leads. And um, so that would be a, a good place to start. Then um, after profiles, which are kind of broad categories, you can kind of be more granular in how you give um, access to objects. And permission sets are another, another way to do this. So for example, if you um, installed, um, like we have LinkedIn installed um, app installed in Salesforce, but not everyone needs to use that. And we have a limited number of licenses. So we have a LinkedIn um, permission set that gives users, um, once they receive this permission, access to the LinkedIn app. And it's important to, um, you know, we, this isn't something we would really um, put in a profile. I'm not sure you could, but it's, it's like granting permission for a very specific thing, you know, um, or maybe um, you you have, you know, we talked about social security numbers as like as fields that not everyone should be able to see. Well, you could make it that that no one can view um, social security numbers, and then you create a permission set where just the very few people that need access, you can give them access through that, and and that. Um, you know, it is is a really, I think, a really good use case for permission sets. I know there are companies that go a little crazy with permission sets. And again, you can have this proliferation of permission sets that um, are a little bit out of control. Sometimes they may you have may have multiple permission sets, like granting the same type of permission. Maybe sometimes people are lazy and they don't say well, do I have an existing permission set I can use, you know, for, for granting access to contacts or accounts? Or maybe that social security number. So it's always a good idea um, before you create a new permission set to see if there's an existing one. And then again, to keep an eye on these, um, maybe there are permission sets that just um, no one is no longer using. And this would be another source of technical debt, you know, people that, 
created permission sets for something, but then that then the, that that app, you know, maybe we created permission set for LinkedIn, and then we decided not to renew LinkedIn after a few years. No one's using it, so we just removed the app. Well, then you want to make sure to delete that permission set too, so it's just not hanging around. Um, so let's see. Um, I wanted to ask you all a question here. Um, so say we have sales reps and sales management, two different types of profiles. Um, what would what would be the difference? Can you um, think of um, maybe, I'm just gonna check the chat. What would be the difference between the sales rep profile and the sales management profile? Um, just for example, and sales management, let's just, you know, be clear those, those are people that are managing the field sales reps. So, um, Um, okay, sales manager should be able to delete the record while rep not. Yes, good idea. Yep. Um, reps can see their own opportunities. Sales managers can see all. Absolutely. Sales reps shouldn't be able to delete, reassign stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So there's definitely things that, you know, managers should be able to um, delete um, opportunities, um, control different things that that um, sales reps just don't need, just don't do have ability to do that. Very good. Good answers. Yep. So we um, moving right along here. Um, okay. So here's another question for everyone. So Acme Fireworks, you have um, been hired as a, this is a scenario. Okay. <clears throat> and I always like um, using Acme Fireworks. But I want you all to think about the scenario for a moment. And then where would you begin? How would you start? So Acme Fireworks is per just purchased Salesforce and you've been tasked with setting up data security. You know, maybe you're part of a team of several consultants that are all doing different things and you've been assigned to data security in this brand new org. Um, how would you start? Ask them about businesses, um, setting up a hierarchy. Yeah, and how would, okay, you want to set up a hierarchy, but what would you, what kind of information would you need to do that? Um, discovery conversations, absolutely, yes. Understand departments, what they need access to, who does what on day to day, absolutely. So yeah, doing discovery um, and you want to kind of do that in an organized manner. Um, in an organized way and going around to teams, um, having having these conversations. Okay, what does your team need? What do you have access to? Um, good, excellent. I think you guys are, you've got a handle on this. Okay, so next steps. Um, so I wanted to take a look um, at the actual module you're gonna be doing. This is, so this is data security. And I have just gone over, I pretty much covered the overview with touching on a few of these other things. So there are one, two, three, four, five, seven different um, modules here. And my thinking was that I wanted everyone to um, begin this um, as soon as you can and, and try and uh, get as far as you can by Wednesday, or maybe Gemma can start leading you in the second hour through this. And then we can, um, that might be a better idea that maybe Gemma can just let me know how far you get. Um, maybe, yep. yep, if some of you, uh, what I was hoping was that if everyone could complete this, um, because this is just um, pretty basic to be honest, um, this data security, it doesn't really um, like uh, do anything about testing. So, um, you know, and that was another question I have for everyone. So you, if you set up your data security model, how would you go about testing it? Um, I'm going to, I'm going to just pose that question to the group mm. in a sandbox. Okay. Yeah. Um, but what exactly, so, okay, we've set it up in a sandbox, but what else, how would you go about testing this? What do you need to do that? Yeah. 
view from different profiles and how would you go about viewing different profiles? Log in as a different user. Uh, that's what I was looking for. Yep, you would need to create users, uh, users for each profile. Log in as them and see if you can like break your security. Can if, if a user is not supposed to have access to accounts, can you log in and see, you know, and somehow get it? So that is, um, yeah, go ahead, Gemma. I was going to say there's one key thing that's missing that you'll need in order to test. Uh, okay. Data. So, uh, yes, yes. We need users. We need um, data. Well, the, sometimes the users, you know, if, if the user is supposed to have create access for accounts, you certainly want to test and make sure that they can create accounts. But if that user um, doesn't have uh, free, if no one can like uh, create accounts, well, maybe they're created by automation. But yeah, you definitely need some data to make sure that each user can access what they're supposed to be able to access and then not access things that they can't access. So in testing, we have um, kind of positive use cases and um, negative use cases. You know, can you do what you're supposed to be able to do? And are you prevented from doing things you're not supposed to be doing? Make sense? Yep. Okay, so that was actually um, part of the homework I was going to create after everyone we went through, um, built up this, um, went through the data security. It was actually to build out more profiles, um, create users, and actually test um, and really understand that, yes, our, our security model is working. And that is something, you know, this, this really isn't covered, but I thought was important and would give you a much better feel for um, really understanding this. Okay, are there any questions for Steve before he has to drop? Yep. I see someone that says build out a list of expected use cases. Absolutely, yep. And that would, so even, um, you know, as you're thinking about testing, saying, okay, who, who all should be able to create uh, accounts, create these different objects, listing them, who can't, um, and then your, your test process, your, your testing would go through and test each individual use case. And then when everything is tested in the sandbox, um, what would be our next step? Pushing it to production, yes, yes. And uh, can you push profiles? Uh, I'm gonna ask Gemma on this one. What's, so if you build out a data security um, model in the sandbox, how would you go about um, pushing that to production? Okay, um, as you say, there's kind of two ways, that, there's two approaches to this. One is what you can see, uh, which is governed by your OWD, your sharing rules, your manual sharing, your team, um, and your role hierarchy. Um, and the other is what you can do, which is governed by your permission sets and profiles. Now, with when you push, when we haven't covered this in detail, but when you create, when you actually test in a sandbox, there's a way that you can up all of the changes that you've made in your sandbox and paste them into your production. Book. Um, and they're called change sets. And pushing pr profiles is a really awkward. Um, mm -hmm. It's an awkward uh, thing to do with change sets because it doesn't really, it doesn't actually push the profiles themselves. What it does is it pushes out of all of the things that you're putting in your change set. Let's say you create a new field and you put a fit in, you do that in the sandbox and then you add it to a change set. If you then deploy that change set into production, so copy and paste it into production, and there's no profiles. Um, added to the ch to the change set, then no one's going to see that field. No one's going to be able to touch it. It's not going to be on any page layouts. It's just going to be there lurking around in the background and people will be like, where's that field you created? If you want to, um, to not only 
push the field, but push the permission sets, uh, push the profile settings and the visibility of that field, you also have to add all the profiles to that change set. And it doesn't actually add, it, and like I say, it doesn't pick up all the profiles themselves and put them and copy and paste them into production. It's only the coverage of permission for the field that you've got in your change set. Does that make sense to everyone? Mm. Yeah, the, kind of the bottom line, it's, it's tricky to build out your data security model in a sandbox and migrate it to um, production. And I have always um, just built out my data security model in production. And you can create profiles and not assign any users to them, or maybe um, create test users and assign them. So personally, I've, I've just made these changes in production um, and been very careful about um, uh, assigning out the, the permission sets and the profiles to, to users. Yeah, sometimes that's the easier thing to do. Yeah, yeah. It can, it can be a long job if you've ever worked with managed packages. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of yeah. them. Uh, that can be a long job, but that's that's more the exception than the, than the norm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, Gemma, I'm going to hand it over to you now. And mm -hmm. um, thank you again, everyone, for allowing me to um, join your happy family. <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. I really enjoyed this. Uh, and uh, maybe you will see me again. And I, I am happy to help out, Gemma. And uh, we can talk some more about, you know, what... Um, Oh, I can help the group out later. But um, I need to bid everyone adieu right now because um, I've got a meeting to jump off to. But thanks again, all. Thank you. Um, we'll see you Wednesday, right? Yes, you will. Yep, for the full two hours. And we'll have to, um, uh, you know, I'm going to create some homework. Um, I think my assumption is that, you know, everyone's going to be able to get through this because you can see each uh, module doesn't take that long. Yeah. And I'm going to assume that you're all going to, you know, just plow through this and be ready for our next challenges. So I'm going to create some homework and I'm going to get that posted. Um, well, I can get that to you, Gemma, um, maybe uh, uh, tomorrow sometime. So everyone can start that. Sure. All right. Thank you very much, Steve. Enjoy your You're welcome. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Bye now. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, everybody. Thank you very much for your pet for your um, your attention. Um, before I we go into mo into moving on to the trailhead badge, um, does anybody have any other questions that they would like me to address, or is there anybody need a bit of clarification on anything? Okay, so Samira says, are there any other exceptions to the rule where it is better to update production directly instead of the sandbox? Um, what I'm supposed to say is, and and I and I, you know, and this this is purity. Um, I do genuinely believe that all changes where possible should be done in the sandbox, but there are some changes that I believe are permissible in production, those include changes to reports, changes to list views, um, maybe the odd page layout change, just to flicker, just to change the position of a field perhaps. The challenge there though, is to be aware of what other projects are going on around you, because you could make some changes in production um, to items that are actually being worked on actively in another, as part of another project. Um, in which case, if you were create, if you were changing the position of a field, and there's another team creating, uh, making some, making a new application or some, adding some new features in the sandbox, and they haven't, they won't have picked up your change to the page layout. So I would always suggest that you know, if if you haven't got any other projects going on, then you can kind of get away with it. My question is, you know, is, is actually more around it why why would you there, there's a risk there's a risk if you do that because if you get yourself into the habit of updating things directly in production you know because it's quicker um then actually you lose the bigger picture 
approach and it get becomes too easy to change things in production and before you know it your production environment has gone out out of control and then people hire people like me to go in and look at it all and go why is that there <laughs> does that answer your question cool um We've always got to think about the bigger picture when we're when we're configuring Salesforce, just because you know it, it can really it can get out of hand and be over engineered very easily. Um, Jeremy says later, perhaps more on migrating profiles. Yes, yes. In fact, I will put change sets onto the curriculum because at some point. I'm going to get, give you a, a scenario for you to uh, build, and I might have to give you some sandboxes um, to practice with, just so that you know. Um, maybe I don't know. Actually, we'll see. Um, sandboxes don't come with developer orgs. That's the thing. Um, okay, so sandbox. Uh, there's a question here about sandboxes. Uh, does the sandbox keep a track of all activities done while moving into production? Uh, yes. So the way that change sets works are it's almost like a list of items that you want to uh, collect, gather up, and then push into production. But in order to push it into production, you have to upload it first. So um, so it creates a unique link. Um, and it, it's connected in it's connected to your production org and when so when when you upload a change set from sandbox it uploads it to your production org so you always have a record of that um, that change set being uploaded and then you go into your production org and you click deploy and it will just run it will run a job um, and it keeps a complete audit trail of when when your deployment has passed or, or been successful or been fa or failed. Um, I normally expect all my change sets to fail when I first go through, otherwise I get angry with it. You know, it's better if you could give yourself, sorry, a nice surprise when the change set deploys by itself without any errors, that's always lovely. Um, but yes, so, but, but it's worth no noticing as well that you can, noting as well that you can actually delete your undeployed or unsuccessful deployments um some some people do because they like to keep things tidy or they like to save face a little bit because some people get a bit funny like if they've tried to de deploy a package like 15 times and still not been able to get in they can feel a bit like their ego is bruised a little bit so i've seen people delete them because they don't want to look like they're rubbish at their job especially when they're consultants um but you know it's 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 not something you can prevent doing. You can't stop people deleting old change sets. Okay, shall we move on to the trailhead badge? Let's go and get hands on. I'm going to present now. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Lovely. Okay. So I'm going to go on to the data security badge that Steve was talking about. So you just go into Trailhead. Hopefully you're all logged in and you click data security and we're going to start with an overview. Um, so just to recap, and I might actually just ask questions, ask you some questions around this. So, um, so when we choose, so if we go back to what um, Steve was talking about, he, he mentioned uh, several different ways of managing data security. Uh, one is through your, um, your general IT settings. So having um, an IP address, uh, using profiles to determine what hours you can log in, where you can log in from. Um, do you need to, and, and this is like the other side of security is things like, um, implementing something called two-factor security. So like, you know, with those websites where you try and log in and then you have to go and get your phone and put in a special code. Um, you know, you, that's something you can configure with Salesforce. And I actually like to use the Authenticator app for that because it works on my watch as well. Um, so if I try and log into my org, um, the first thing it does is say, um, 
we've sent you an approval request, it comes up on my watch, I tap it and it logs me into Salesforce. So that's the extra security. That's what I refer to as the IT policy security. In this badge, we're looking at a recruitment app, um, which is your obvious security kind of scenario, really, because you've got confidential information in there, like salary amounts, you've got performance reviews, you've got social security numbers, um, or if you're in the UK, um, national insurance numbers. Um, you'll want to keep that information sens uh, sensitive data. You want to keep it, make sure that it's only seen by the right people for the right reason. So you can control access to your whole org, a specific object, a specific field, as Steve was saying, or even an individual record. And although you can configure all of this using the interface, the model actually works at the API level. I'm going to skip down. Oops, no, I'm not. I'm going to go and open up my trailhead playground and just show, just show you around a little bit. Hands on orgs. My trailhead playground, playground number three. Okay, let's take a look around because I know that you've been, um, we've looked at the concepts of sharing and security. I'm going to give you a little look around um, the app and see what that looks like in real life. So we're going back to our, um, our original trailhead playground and we're going backstage. That's the first place we're going. So we're going to go to setup and I'm just going to show you around a little bit. Um, everything that you need to change around security is in the setup menu and with the exception of your field level security, most of it is in the same place. Object manager is where you'll find your field level security from where you create your fields. The rest of it is in a, an area called sharing settings. As Steve said, the way that, uh, the way that your sharing goes is it starts with your, your, with your OWD, your organization wide defaults. And your organization wide defaults is done per object. There are three main settings for your OWD. And as Steve was saying, how do you know like what you start with and what to change, etc.? It all comes through asking the right questions. And this comes with experience, this comes with um, an understanding of the business process primarily, though. Um, the minute my rule, I, I generally tend to go by the rule that. If there's one person somewhere that wants to keep some data secret or private, then we have then that's the point where it needs to, you need to you need to change your default external access. And there are two approaches for how you change that ex not your default external access. That's the thing I was reading at the time. Um, there are there are kind of two approaches to that. The questions that I tend to ask is if people say, I want a way of tracking this, that and the other, my next question will be, OK, and who should be able to do that and why? And how should they be able to do that? Because then in my head, I'm starting to formulate, OK, that might be a custom field which needs to appear on this page layout. Um, and then I've got a formula field that needs to calculate this, which then needs to drive a workflow rule or process builder, which then might be picked up by some code, which might then be pinged off to another system, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like a daisy chain of different features. Um, but underpinning all of that is the security and level of access for users. So if I edit this, I've, got, I've just come into the, the sharing settings and you will see a list of objects um, that you can change the sharing settings for and the defaults for. Remember we talked about the different types of relationships when we created objects the other week? We talked about lookup fields and we talked about master detail uh, relationship fields. Now, if you have got, um, this is where your ownership becomes really important to remember here because if you are if you are creating a record which is not the child of another object, yeah? So you're creating a record on the lead object. The lead object has no parent, okay? Um, so what that means is, first of all, the lead 
object will have an owner. So any record you create that is a lead will have an owner and it will default to you being the owner. Um, but that also means that you can change the OWD for that record. So you can change it with leads and cases, you get these extra special access levels. Um, but generally what you tend to get is you get private. That means only you and people above you in the role hierarchy can see and change that record. Okay, so it is yours and it is your manager's um, for changing. When you have a private model, that's when you might use Teams. That's when you might use manual sharing. That's when you might use a sharing role to create blanket sharing opportunities, right? Let's say that, let's say all, all leads are shared within one single team, which is what Steve was saying earlier. Then you could use a sharing role to open up access just for that team. Um, but if you've got a special team, let's say you've got a HR team in the recruitment app and they say, well, only um, our, we only want our team to be able to see these records. At that point, that tells you in your head straight away that it's a private sharing model for that object, which means if anyone else needs to see that data, you've got to then ask the question, how often does this happen? Does this person need to access this data on a one-off basis, which is the manual side? Or does this person want to access data based on a rule? So is it only you know, employee records that are hidden. You might want to open up previous employee, employee records, for example, or candidate records, if you're storing employees and candidates in the same object. Make sense? So you're thinking about this thing, this kind of stuff all the time. Uh, public read only. That means every, anyone, can, anyone in the organization can see that record, but only the owner and person above them in the role hierarchy can change it. Public read write is a free for all, and public read write transfer is a free for all um, with transfer rights for leads and cases. And the reason that you have that just for leads and cases is that leads and cases can come in from the public. And what and what generally happens with a lead is someone might go to a website, fill out a web to lead form, which is a piece of functionality we have in Salesforce that exposes fields from the lead onto your website. So that if people fill out that form, in flies the lead, and then you can determine who needs to change to transfer that lead record. You can have the same thing for cases. It's called web to case. So if you've ever if you've ever had a problem and you've needed to uh, and you've needed to ask for help through somebody's website, and it says fill out this form, and someone will get back to you. Uh, web to case is a classic um, example of that of the solution that might sit behind that. So, so these are your OWDs. You can actually check, you've got kind of two forms of this. You've got internal access, which is for you and your users. And then you've got external access, which is if you're using communities. And communities are effectively just portals. It's a way of exposing your data model to, um, to customers. So they can log in and they can see their account record. They can change the contact details. They can maybe add, add some records in a custom object, et cetera. And when we are working with communities, that's when you will often see these sharing um, settings are locked right down. Uh, because the worst, last, worst thing you can do is have two people seeing each other's personal data. It's just, oh, God. And in, this, in, in the recent years where we've had new legislation come through, so uh, the CCPA Act, which is in California, which is uh, Data Privacy Act, and then we have the GDPR in Europe. Um, you suddenly noticed, may have noticed if you live in, in Europe um, or the UK, um, that a couple of years ago, 2018, you suddenly had this one month where everyone was emailing you going, this is our privacy policy, take a look at our privacy policy. And now every website you go to, you have to accept cookies. That's because of that law. It's a, a law that came through and that is widely accepted. And it's generally the rule around your right to be forgotten as an individual, but also your marketing preferences uh, to be respected as an individual. So in the previous times, the marketing practice used to be, if you don't want to receive this email, just opt out. Whereas now in GDPR terms, I think it's slightly different for CCPA, but, um, and there's a new one coming in Australia as well. Um, but in, in, today's, in today's rules, you have to opt in to receive marketing communications. 
So there's a lot more onus on, on businesses to make sure and be able to prove that they're compliant with those laws by including data privacy in the design of their applications. Um, at the moment, there's there's no real like pure guidance around from anybody because ultimately it's down to you. Like if you run a business, it's down to you how you keep the how you keep the data um, under control. All Salesforce can do is provide you with the tools that enable you to do that. Um, and, and they already do. They give you all the sharing stuff. So, so by object, you can kind of change these. Now, you'll notice that there are some, some here that are, um, that are called controlled by parent. These are where you have a um, parent-child relationship between, rec between objects. So you'll typically see those where you have a master detail relationship. So uh, we know that um, accounts and contacts, for example, um, not account and contract, um, contacts, you notice that that's by default, it says controlled by parent. What that means is because contact, uh, accounts are parents to contacts, that because accounts are public read write, read write, that also means that contacts will be read write because they're controlled by parent. If I change that to, to private, then it's going to say for my contact records, because contacts are controlled by parent, they're also going to be private. And notice how opportunities change to private as well. You can actually make those changes. Um, you can change it back. You can change opportunities to be public read only. Well, no, you can't because it will shout at you. So, so those those things are important to kind of bear in mind. We also talked about uh, there's a couple of there's a couple of other things that you can do here. Um, standard report visibility. There are there are a few other settings that you can have. So if you okay, so so this what this means this is this is the sort of permission that you might give to someone in finance. So um, potentially, so if, if you switch this, if you enable this setting, your users can actually view reports that are based on standard report types that might expose data of users to whom they don't have access. Regard so basically, if you if you tick this, it means that sometimes you can bypass those organisation-wide sharing. User manual sharing record, so users can share their own user record haven't seen that used very often before um, but if you I can think of that if you wanted to allow people to update their own details um, with, or allow someone else to up to change their details like if you were an executive and you had uh, an assistant and you wanted to allow that assistant to change your your user record then you could allow that to happen uh, manager groups is also really important because your role hierarchy isn't necessarily shouldn't necessarily match the way that your business is um, your organization is set up in terms of business reporting lines um, I have this conversation with cu with customers very frequently because they they tend to go well I've already thought about my role hierarchy and I can talk you through the team structure and here it is and I want it all to be part of my role hierarchy. When you change that conversation to be less about how they're structured as a business and more about well if I'm in the UK office, you know, does someone else need to be able to see my information? And they go, well. We've got this guy over here who runs the whole of Europe, and then we've got French and German. Um, we've got French and German data that needs to be kept private or kept within France and within Germany. Within Germany is classic one because the German Workers Council. There's data that's you know they they have to be able to prove that they got the controls to show that they're not being that that the, their business decisions aren't being influenced by you know factors happening outside. So. Um, and that's that's only a very 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 small part of that, um, but in that situation, you can you can you might set up your role hierarchy to be a bit different, or you might have some sharing roles in there, and you might you you will then have to be fairly strategic about which role you put your people in, depending on what data they need to see. And manager groups is a way of handling some other some other weird use cases as well. Um, 
you know, where you can share records with your managers and manager subordinate groups, even if your manager is in a different role. So if this manager role uh, runs the UK, but then also runs China, you know, you kind of go with, well, what role do we put him in? Because, we, you know, we can't really share unless we give him a role of his own, which is his name. And that's not really the best thing to do. So we can use manager groups to handle that. Secure guest user record access. This is a very wordy description, but um, this enables you to secure what guest users can see on your org's data. Uh, guest users might be, um, if you've got, so if let's say you have a managed package um, and you have opened up access to their support team, um, you should be able to hide some data from them. From them. Um, to, in order to make sure that their support, the way they're supporting you is relevant and they can only see data that makes sense. Everyone clear on OWDs and how you change them? Okay. Cool, okay. We've talked a lot about role hierarchy. Can anyone guess where we might be able to go and change the role hierarchy? Okay. Yes, we do have to find the roles menu and where we can find the roles menu is under users. So if we go to, I'm just going to type in roles, you'll find it under the, under the um, users and role, you'll find it under the users menu. So if I click roles, you'll get this page and no matter how many times you tell it not to show this page again, it still keeps showing you that page again. So don't worry too much. And then everybody's given Everybody is given a list of roles, and there are several ways that you can you can view those roles. Um, in Trailhead Playgrounds, when you when you open up a brand new org, it's usually blank. It would just say, you know, the name of your company, and then it would say add role, and there'd be nothing else there. And you have a lot of fun just kind of building out those roles. I say fun in the most sarcastic way. Um, there are several ways that you can view. I personally prefer the role hierarchy view here that you get. I have been in orgs where they've got a ridiculous volume of roles and it gets really difficult to, to see, usually because they've set it up completely um, based alongside their organization's reporting tree. And then, of course, once a year, the admins get told to go in and change it because they're having a restructure. Um, and that's what we also refer to as admin overhead. Um, and we try to avoid admin overhead whenever we um, design our role hierarchies or design anything in Salesforce really because it should be with roles I, per, I, I firmly believe it should be about the sharing and not about the organizational structure. So there's a few ways you can you can view it. I personally use the tree view a lot but you can use a sorted list view for whom if you want to. That might actually solve my problem um, of the order of creating those. Um, but if every role is basically like a record, it just has it. Here is the role, here is what it reports to, here is what how it appears on a report. Then you have a just a normal kind of list view, which is not sorted. Um, and this helps you to see it kind of in reporting lines. When for the um, certified technical architect exam, um, I start I used to start drawing when I was doing my practicing, I used to start constantly drawing them out like this. I eventually just found it easier to just draw a diagram. But you can see that your top role is usually the CEO. What I like to do is have the CEO report into a system administrator team, especially if you've got private sharing model. Um, even as it, I mean, as a system administrator, it generally means that you can um, see and change all data. Um, but if you don't give yourself a role, it can be fairly awkward when you're working with reports um, and, you, and your people um, break drill down their reports by role, which is something you can do with opportunities. So I like to put them in a role that's right at the top. Another reason I like to do it at the top, uh, put, put the system administrators in a role at the top is because if we are, or, and same with integration users, is that if we have um, integrations coming in from other systems and lots and lots and lots of data, 
um, that's coming in that isn't really supposed to be owned by anybody, like financial transactions, it will still have an owner and that owner will tend to be the integration user. Um, and if that integration user is right at the bottom of the hierarchy and then you try to access that record, Salesforce run has to run some checks when you open up a record to say, okay, who are you? What role are you in? Where, what position is that role in the, in, the, in the role hierarchy? And then when you kind of change that record, it has to go through all the way up the, the role hierarchy and then all the way back down again. Uh, to, and that can, that can really affect the performance of your system. So we like to put our integration users in a role that's above the CEO, because then when that information is accessed, it only has, to, only has to check one level in the role hierarchy instead of going all the way down and all the way up again. Uh, it's a bad explanation. I will clarify that and get the proper explanation, maybe demonstrate it uh, in, a, in a, a later time. But it is really important which position you put certain users in, in your hierarchy. So in this standard one, what we've got is your kind of classic C-suite. So your CEO is the big boss. You've got the CFO, chief finance officer, chief ops officer sitting and reporting into them. You might have your SVPs of customer service. Um, I don't know why they don't have a C-suite. Well, they probably report into chief ops officer uh, generally. Um, HR, sales and marketing. And then within sales, you might see because a lot of sales roles tend to be based on um, geographical territory or industry alignment or, you know, some or uh, industry horizontal, which is like size of business. You might see um, you might see these roles kind of broken down a bit um, because, you know, certainly if, they, if it's territorial sales model, because, you know, if it's someone who's in the eastern sales team owns an opportunity, you want the direct the their director to see that data. But then you also want the SVP of sales and marketing to see that data. And then you also want the CEO to see that data. So that's what this hierarchy is doing. It means that it but it also means that if, if an opportunity is owned in a private sharing model, if an opportunity is owned by the director of direct sales, who's going to be able to see it? That's a question. Sorry, I wasn't very clear then. I'm going to I'm going to set you a quick question. If I uh, if it's a private sharing model and I own an opportunity and I'm in the director direct sales role, who is going to be able to see the record first of all? Yeah, Jeremy, you're right. So everyone up the food chain from that role and your role. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yes, Samira, VP North America. Yep. Yeah. Anyone else? Up the food chain, yeah, absolutely. Um, if I own um, an opportunity in a private sharing model and I'm in the Western sales team and my friend who sits next to me is also in the Western sales team, are they gonna be able to see my opportunity? Before anything else, Samira. Samira, I know you know this stuff. I can tell. <laughs> so, no. Exactly. Well, so Jeremy says, depends on how that field security is set up. The field security is different. Field security is what, what field can you see on the page layout? So, if I, this is more about what opportunity. If I own that opportunity, I'm in Western sales team and my best friend next to me is also in the Western sales team. In a private sharing model, we're not going to be able to see each other's opportunities. But our boss is going to be able to see our opportunities. Second question, if I'm sat next to, if I'm in the Western sales team and I've got someone else sitting on my right who is in the Eastern sales team, can they see my opportunity? No, they can't. Can our boss see my opportunity and their opportunity? Yes. Can the SVP of HR see my opportunity and their opportunity? No, they can't. Because can anyone explain why? Can anything anyone think of why?
that's in fact you're all right yes so we do because because i don't report to hr he is parallel to the svp of sales but in a different reporting chain and a different hierarchy that's absolutely right thanks everybody so with the exception of samira can anybody guess how i can open up access between those areas if i needed to <laughs> Kat says sharing rules like she said earlier yes absolutely that's right but Natasha is also right she says team sharing you can do it with team sharing can anyone think of why why would you what situations would you use team sharing for So yes, you can use it for opportunities and accounts. They're the correct objects. What about a business scenario? If I if I wanted to share all of my um, opportunities with HR, what would I use? No? Okay, so so you would use team sharing if you just wanted to give one person access to that opportunity and you're right you got the you got the um the objects correct you would use sharing rules if you had a certain criteria of opportunities that you wanted to share with someone in a regional sales team or in hr or you know on the moon etc it's like a it's a rule and, and um, let me explain to you the two ways that you can create sharing rules. Sharing rules you create in the sharing settings section. And the sharing rules are actually kind of, they're, they're a bit further down the page. So you have your OWDs here, then you have your settings. And then if you keep scrolling down, you can see sharing rules as related lists to the sharing um, ob objects here. Now, in a private share, I mean, in a public sharing rule, they're all useless, right? So if you've got if you've got read write uh, public read write on the objects, then there's no point having sharing rules. You just don't need them. If you've got public read only, you might need sharing rules if you need to give blanket read write access to pe to a certain number of people. Um, if you've got private sharing, if you've got private sharing model, you then would definitely need sharing rules if you were applying a blanket share to someone else in a different section of the role hierarchy or in or who is in the same role as you or is in a sibling role to you there are two ways that you can share data with a sharing rule i just hit new and when we create our sharing rules there are two types we can create a rule that's based on the owner of the record or we can create a rule that's based on certain criteria so let's say we have a sales support function and a private sharing model. I could share, actually, and then there's kind of two scenarios. One is that you could share all opportunities within the entire sales team, in which case you could go role and subordinates, direct, uh, what are we saying, SVP of sales and marketing. Role and subordinates means anybody who's in SVP sales and marketing downwards, you could share with another role, which could be called sales support or customer support or you know a specific role. And then you just start adding users to that role. Another option that you have is to share with role and subordinates. So let's say opportunities have to be private for everybody unless they're in sales. You might you might actually you would you'd be justified in saying I want to share anything that's any leads owned by role and subordinates SVP sales and marketing with role and subordinates SVP sales and marketing, which means basically everyone in sales shares but nobody outside outside sales can see. Does that make sense? That's like creating a sales bubble, if you like. Um, there are other things you can do too. 
Um, if you've got people, let's say you've got um, people, remember we talked in the role hierarchy uh, about, in fact, I'm going to open that up. It's a good idea to have your role hierarchy up so you can at least refer to it. Um, let's say I wanted to create, let's say I wanted to share some sensitive information with just the managers and the managers are all in their own roles. Um, I could actually combine all those roles together in what's called a public group, which you would have seen referred to here. A public group is a way of bringing individuals, individual roles and roles and subordinates into one place just to make it easier for you to share. So you could say share with the managers and then that could be, you know, a named person. I wouldn't, I'd come and kick you if you did do that, but um because it's not scalable, you'll have to get, if that person leaves, you've got to take them out of that role and then you've got to put a new person in that in that group, sorry, and then you've got to put a new person in that group. You know, it's just crap. You don't want to do that. Best thing you can do is, is actually have people in roles and then add the roles into the, into the groups and then share with the groups. So it's just a way of kind of hire, uh, creating a, a sharing hierarchy, um, as Steve was saying earlier. Uh, doo -doo 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 wait for that to load it's going to show me that godforsaken page again and if it doesn't i'm wrong i'm wrong yay i'm wrong so um in that example i might want to create a public group which contains uh my svp of customer service and support my svp of hr my svp of sales and all of their vps but not the people who report into them i might create a, a report um a public group which contains each of those roles and then that means that if there's a, if if i need all of those guys to see invoices for all of their customers i could make invoices private because if no one else is supposed to see invoices that's fine um and then i can create a sharing role that share that shares any invoices owned by finance um share with this public group which contains all these roles and it's nice and scalable because as people leave, you you then uh, deactivate their user record. And then as people join, you allocate them a role and that gives them automatic uh, membership of, of the public groups that that role belongs to. Okay. I know this is all conceptual. You can't really get too hands on with this until you do the homework, um, which is what I would have set you anyway is, as well is to is to go through and um, and actually test a private sharing model. You kind of have to go through that nasty experience to understand it. So that's that's how you would share based on role. There's another thing you can do, which is based on criteria. This is where this this. Um, set of fields might look quite familiar to you now where you choose the field you choose the operator and you choose the value so let's say you wanted to say um, only share email uh, leads where email opt-out equals false so only people who want to receive emails you could share that with the marketing team so that anyone who doesn't any any leads that you own that where email where they haven't consent where they haven't consented to share information with marketing, you could actually change, you could actually put that criteria in there. So even though marketing might be able to see, because we've got an ownership sharing rule that says anything owned by sales and marketing downwards gets shared with sales and marketing downwards, you could then restrict that even further to say, well, actually, um you just you just need to only only information where they have said that they're happy to be emailed is what you share with marketing and you use that for use criteria based sharing for that again you can share with a public group a role and role and subordinates and you can determine whether you share based on um read only or read write jeremy's got a good um business scenario there so for leads for example uh lead source equals trade show plus other criteria share with the regional sales team absolutely you could do that same for um for re for regions generally as well so you could go by billing city uh sorry billing state <laughs> equals minnesota then share with you know x team show my very poor geography let's say london then let's go for london so if the city equals london you could share with a london Role and subordinates, London team. And within that, you might have North London, South London, East London, West London, etc. 
So you can get really granular, but I would urge you to try and uh, think about what's the best way to make this easier on your admin to look after. We always have to be kind to our admins. Any questions on that at all? So we've talked about OWDs, we've talked about role hierarchy. I'm not going to talk about territories, but territories is another a more advanced way that you can share information. And that's when you have a sales team specifically who are regularly reviewing their accounts. And then each year, perhaps they'll create a new, a new model of sharing based on what the year's objectives are for example we want to go after industry verticals you could create territories and then you assign records to territories and you assign users to territories and then that um, inherits the sharing that goes with that as well um, and that, that happens quite a lot you have to you have to create you can create multiple territory models but you have to activate them and you have to run certain rules every month, every year or how often, however often you change the territories um, just to make sure that the accounts are held in the right territories and therefore the, sh the record is shared with, uh, with users who belong to that territory. So it's kind of a, just a different way of sharing. Um, I have got another, I've got a recorded lesson on territory management as well, which I'm happy to share with you should you want to go and have a look at that um but it's more advanced the so territory management video i'll put a link to that in the resources for you if you if you are so inclined then we talked about let me just uh check where we are on the security okay so we've talked about levels of data access organization wide object wide field-wide, record-wide, so we looked at role hierarchy sharing and manual sharing. Um, I did actually have a look earlier at manual sharing, and Steve is absolutely right. You can't manually share records in Lightning just yet, but somebody's written an app for it, which I've put a link to in the chat for you. Um, and I will put a link to that in the resources as well, so manual sharing for Lightning. Um, there is salesforce actually has an idea exchange which is really interesting um it's a way of putting ideas for platform functionality um into salesforce uh into the community forum and you can kind of upvote it so if you if you want it badly enough if you think that the, if you if you there's a feature that you want it to do that it doesn't do right now go and vote either create the idea or search for an existing one and vote for it because the more the more you vote the more points get allocated to it and the, and the product team at Salesforce actually are actively looking through the idea exchange for ideas. And then they have a new program that's, I think we're on the second round of now, where they look at all the prioritized ideas and you can allocate a certain number of points to ideas that you think are more important. So they shortlist them and then you allocate points to them. And the highest number of points will get um, considered for a, new, for a future release. So they do listen to customers and they have a systematic way of doing it, which is really good. Um, okay, so let's do the little quiz uh, to start with. So hopefully you're all on your uh, on your trailhead. I'm gonna have to go incognito again because I've done this one before apparently. So if your brains haven't dribbled through your, out through your ears just yet, hopefully you should uh, still be awake. So you can configure, no, question number one, you can configure access to data at all of the following levels, except A, organization, B, objects, C, page layouts, D, records. Awesome, okay, question number two, which of these is not a method for controlling record level access? A, OWDs, B, role hierarchy, C, profiles, D, sharing rules. Okay, hit the button, let's see how you got on. Magic, cool. Okay, so you both know, I mean, I, th I think the answers are both C. 
Um, page layouts, you don't configure access to data, but you can configure what you can do to the data. And then um, C, you can, your profiles don't control record level access, it's more object level access. Okie dokie, let's go to the next one then. So control access to the org. This is where you can, this is a hands-on one. So this is where you can, I think this is a nice one to do in the last 10 minutes and then we can, um, and then I'll let Steve take, take you a bit further um, on Wednesday. So this is where we talk about the IT policies, if you like. So being able to control uh, information at an at, at access at an organization level. So managing users. So creating a user, you basically just go into Salesforce, click, uh, click users and hit new. Now, a couple of things that you need to bear in mind when you're creating users is that um, the fact that a user is active is, sorry, a user is using up a license, a Salesforce license, when that active button is ticked. When you've run out of licenses, you won't be able to activate any users on a standard Salesforce profile. I'll show you what that means. I just click new user. And you get to fill in all the lovely stuff about who they are, where they come from, what's their phone number, what's their favorite color. Um, you get to give them some very basic user level permissions. Um, you get to give them a role and you get to give them a profile. Remember that Steve said every user has to have a profile where every profile type is connected to a user license. So you'll notice when I click new, I it defaulted to Chatter External. Chatter External is a way of bringing other users in to come and talk to you in Chatter, but giving them nothing else. So it's a way of opening up access to like employees or customers that you know you perhaps wouldn't want them to see data in the system, but you still want to talk to them. Um, then you have, I wouldn't worry too much about most of these licenses. The primary ones that you'll be working with are either Salesforce platform or Salesforce generally. Um, and the reason I can't select a Salesforce license, it doesn't appear in the list, is because I actually have used up my quota of Salesforce licenses. Um, so if I look at my list, I've already got Dave Stevens, who is uh, using up a standard license. Now, if I hit edit and deactivate Dave Stevens, and then I go to create a new, and I save that, and I go to create a new user, I will be able to see that user license called Salesforce becomes available again. And that's because Dave has given up his seat. So new user, he doesn't know it yet, but he's fired. So I hit Salesforce, and then I can choose any of the profiles that match that, that go along with that license. So he could be a system admin, or he could have a custom profile. And at that point, he can also have a role. Standard Salesforce users have roles. There are certain community users that also have roles, and partner community users have roles too. Um, so, so that's where you kind of control that. Um, Something else, where is it gone? Yeah. Whereas I overview data security, control access to the org. Oh, I was incognito, that's right. Um, so that's how you can you can add up to 10 users at a time if you go to add multiple users. Deactivating a user, you just that means they can't log in anymore. Um, but it also wants you to define, you notice how I, when I deactivated Dave, it came up with a couple of options. I have to define what's going to happen to his data after it, after I've deactivated him. So deactivating him is one thing you can do, but you've got to think about, if you're an admin, you've got to think about what do I do with his accounts? What do I do with his opportunities and leads? Who's going to pick those up? So, you know, off when I was working for DMB and I was in a sales department, people come and say, oh, this, this person's leaving, can you deactivate them? And actually what I would say is, when are they leaving? What do they need to do before they leave? Is there anything that I should restrict them from doing before they leave, like exporting data? That was an important one. So we used to actually put them on a leavers profile. We used to have a, a profile that was just for people who were on their way out. We would put them on that profile, they couldn't export any reports, they wouldn't be sent any reports, they couldn't export any data, they couldn't import any data. They could literally, literally just had the bare minimum they needed to do while they were checking out, if you like. Because in a sales environment, the worst thing you, you can do, especially if someone's going to, going to a competitor, is 
let people download data and take it away with them. Um, but also it's not compliant either. You would have your knuckles wrapped. Um, potentially huge fines actually if someone ran off with all your data. Um, but anyway, it's just a lot of things to consider. The actual act of deactivating a user is dead easy, as you've seen. It's just you've got to think, you've got to put the brain power in first before you do it. A um, couple of things you can do: you can set password policies. You can set an amount of time before all users' passwords expire. You can actually change the level of complexity. You can, uh, and this should really be in line with your with your company's IT policy. Um, make a point of finding out what those IT policies are. We call those non-functional requirements because they're nothing to do with how you work as a business. Um, with the app, you know, what what fields do I need to track on a lead? How what happens when I convert a lead? What happens when I close a win? What does closed one mean? All of those things. Those are functional requirements. These are non-functional requirements because it's actually more in line with, you know, will I allow people to log in from home? If I do allow them to log in from home, do they have to use a VPN? In which case, my VPN will, will have a range of IP addresses that are permitted within that VPN. And is it those IP addresses, that range of IP addresses that I allow people to log in from, et cetera? So that's, these are kind of the, these are the, the non functional requirements. How long should your password be? Um, you can actually whitelist any trusted IP ranges. <laughs> That's a cheeky trick that I do sometimes, actually. If I'm logging in uh, to someone's org from home or from out on the road, and uh, you know, sometimes I sometimes I need to log in and I get fed up of you know having to give activation codes all the time, I might whitelist my home my home IP address. Um, you know, if I know that no one else is going to be able to access that. I wouldn't do it if I was in a cafe, God no, but you know, if I was at home and I was constantly in and out of the org and I, I I, I would I would probably do that just to stop it from from challenging me. Um, yeah, uh, restricting login access by IP address is what I talked about, and then you can actually do it by time as well. You can actually if you if you are nice people running a business and you want people to only work between nine and five, you know that would be lovely. You could actually stop people from logging into Salesforce, um, you know, outside of those hours. Um, which is a nice way to help people switch off, but then you're kind of defeating the object if you give them mobile app as well, but who knows? Um, you could stop them from logging into the mobile app with those logging out login hours as well. Aha, uh -huh, single sign-on question from Jamie. I'll answer that one in a minute. <laughs> so we're going to have a quick go at this. Um, if you could please go to your Trailhead Playground. It should take five minutes, if that uh we are going to go and create a new user challenge we take this challenge so launch your playground we are going to create a new user with the following settings this is going to be a system administrator and the username has to have guest admin in it so i'm glad i did that um, so in your username, I'm just going to go guest admin at um, <laughs> resourcefulwolf.com. Okay, just give it your email address. It looks like it's only checking the it's only checking the uh, username, so I think you're good to call it whatever you want. I'll go for Daenerys, why not? Uh, CEO. And if you're not sure where to go, remember you go to setup, users, and users, and then new user. And then just save it. And then you might get an email with offering you a new password. And when you're ready, just go and check challenge. Don't forget to give them the system admin profile. Oh, new user must be inactive. Ha ha, it's probably gonna fail because I made them active. So that will catch you out. 
yeah, an inactive user with guest admin in the username was not found. So I'm going to go back to my users and I'm going to edit Daenerys and I'm going to deactivate her just like Jon Snow did. Oh, sorry if it was, oh God, spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops, my big mouth. And here, when you deactivate, you can remove user from uh, from account teams, opportunity teams of closed opportunities, which I probably wouldn't want to do because <laughs> because uh, I wouldn't because if if someone worked on an opportunity in the past, then I would still want to reflect that in case they come back. Um, I would want to remove them from opportunity teams of open opportunities, um, and from ca predefined case teams and ad hoc case teams. So hit save especially if there's a salesperson. Okay, so let's uh, go back and check it again. And it should be okay. Deactivate is just a case of editing the user and unticking the box on the right that says active. So you just untick it. It's amazing, this little checkbox determines, you know, which, which license get, well, that a license gets used. Woohoo! I got a badge, mostly because I've done it already, but hopefully you've all got 500 points for that one. Did you all get points? Hooray! Oh, deactivating you're just deactivating okay take a moment um jamie i'm gonna answer your question jamie said how much of this is in play with something like federated access with azure active directory do you have experience uh yes i do and i do know about this i've had to learn it um salesforce fully supports um single sign-on it also supports um azure um with Azure, it, you can you can let it work with um, intermediary um, identity providers like um, like Okta, and you can also have it work with Active Directory as well. So it will do the provisioning and the deprovisioning as well. Ping identity, yes, it will work with that as well, definitely. Um, in terms of the in terms of the technical detail around that. Um, as it will, will support SAML and it will support OpenID as well. So I've actually set it up with Google, uh, with G Suite as well. I've, I can log in and provision users automatically using G Suite. Um, and it's just a matter, you, there's a couple of things you have to do. You have to give it, you have to enable a feature called My Domain, um, which is, oh my God, I've just discovered my daughter is sneakily using her iPad and I told her not to. <gasps> Naughty. Anyway, um, it enables you to, it's gone out of my head. Apologies, I forgot what I was saying. I got distracted. <laughs> um, Jamie, we can have a little chat about that offline if you want. I'm happy to do that. Um, in the meantime, I will let everybody go because it is time for the session to end. Thank you very much for coming along and listening um, to our first chat around sharing it is an important topic but it's also a big topic to learn as well so thank you everybody take care of yourselves and i'll see you on wednesday <laughs>